Good evening all and welcome. It's day two of Nature Week and I have some absolutely phenomenal stories for you tonight. The first ones are some of the best I have read in living memory. You will love them. Be sure to stick around for the end. The stories are, as we say in England, bangers tonight. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forests and not many neighbours. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I had been a paramedic for about four or five years, and being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organisation. For being such a tiny, poorly funded organisation, we were surprisingly busy in the nine years that I was with them. We'd have at least one rescue several times every weekend spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls were the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bikers and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wrecked or get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, then fly them out on a helicopter, or put them on a strokes basket mounted to a junky ass trailer thing, and we'd pull a quad. About two weeks after joining, and with zero training beyond what I had learned as a boy scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party. For some reason, they had put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They set out again and looked for him for four or five hours and gave up and called 911. The first interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive. No more than 20 minutes, but we were already eight or nine hours behind the ball. We did a very quick briefing, distributed maps and divided into teams, then set off. They put me on a quad with the most experienced guy and we headed out. The plan was for each two to three person team to take one of the longer trails that ringed the place. Then after searching those, we'd systematically work out ways into the shorter maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search, none of that grid search crap just riding around looking for clues. I don't know what I had expected exactly. Maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something. But these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged, technical trails, where you really had to know what the hell you were doing and where you were going, or you'd never make it out alive. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain, and tree cover, radios, and cell phones were a crapshoot. The maps didn't account for all the random trails riders would just sort of make up. The only marked roads were fire breaks, and mileage-wise, those accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone, or put at the front of the group, is a mystery. Four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted, and just done. We take a water break, and hear broken radio traffic that sounds like the bike has been found but no rider. It's only a few miles from us, so we head in that direction. When we get there, the bike is off one side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet into the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is very dead. Lips blue, skin dusty, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes look to be wide open and solid white, but when I examined him, I could see his eyes were actually covered with fly eggs. The dude had been dead a while. It didn't make sense though, his bike still had gas in it. He had water and food, and he was a healthy guy in his late twenties. Why was he dead? It looked like he had simply laid down his bike and then ran into the woods to die. Mission accomplished, I guess. We wrap him up in blankets, and then put him in strokes, and took him to the trailhead where the coroner was waiting. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death was. 
The pathologist determined it was cardiac dysthymia, secondary to extreme anxiety. The guy literally died of fright, which up to that point I had always assumed was Hollywood bullshit. I've always wondered what was going through his head. Was he just afraid of the woods or of being lost? If so, why did he blindly run into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard a lot of stories about weird stuff in the woods and have seen a few strange things myself, so it wouldn't surprise me. I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaska Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they'd finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January. The sun hadn't quite come up yet. And when I say the sun hadn't quite come up, I mean in almost a month and a half. Polar nights are intense. The particular weld site we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and end of the ice roads, a guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety. No cell receptions and radios work only up to a distance. If you don't check in or out at a set time, they come looking for you to ensure you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it mattered in the landscape of endless night, and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow, as the speed limit on the road was only 25 miles an hour, when something appeared on the road in our headlights. It was a man, in jeans, sneakers and a hoodie jacket, walking down an ice road in the wilderness tundra at 4am, and it was minus 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he was trying to get back to the guard shack. Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us as our trucks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He still didn't acknowledge us and just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotions. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he had been in an accident and was in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of peculiar smells coming off him. He smelled... acridic, if that makes sense? There was just a lot of this guy that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had just about had enough of this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later said he was just going to try and shake him out of his stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him though, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy and then at me with this look of pure rage, not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, the guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held on to my buddy to keep him inside. After several moments, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we'd just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank, but policy said they had to check it out regardless. 
My buddy's arm was sore, and when he pulled back his sleeve, there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard, and we were told to just head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened, and it was quite a drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day. The next time we saw the guard at the shack, we asked him if he ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12 hour shift and saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste his shift driving around. But it wasn't a prank. Who would make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfactory answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder about that dude. If he even was a dude. The Alaskan tundra is a weird place, and that was just one of many weird stories from my time up there. Here's another story from the North Slope. It was March. While still in the depths of Arctic winter, with the equinox approaching, the day slash night cycle was becoming even more. My flight to the slopes was delayed due to a large blizzard, which shut down the Dead Horse and Kaparuk airstrips. I spent three days waiting in Anchorage until the storm cleared and we were able to fly. Landing at the Kaparuk airstrip, it was evident the blizzard was more severe than we had initially thought. While whiteout blizzards are common, actual snow accumulation is not. This storm though was a monster. Snowdrifts several stories tall ran against the camping house. Our work trucks and equipment were completely covered in snow and it took a full day of digging to get them out. As soon as the trucks were free, we were off to our first job assignment. No time to rest in the oil field. Traveling anywhere after a storm this size is a nightmare. To get to the work site, we had a bulldozer escort us, breaking up any remaining drifts as we went. The dozer cleared our work area around the well house and we began to rig up our equipment. It took a little time. As soon as we were back to the normal humdrum life of the Arctic oil well maintenance, over the radio we get a call from the bulldozer operator as he left that he had seen a giant black animal heading in our direction. He couldn't tell if it was a wolf or a big dog, but it was massive and moving erratically. In the winter, many animals aren't active on the slope. Caribou, musk oxen and foxes are the usual wildlife you'll encounter out in the snow. The animals keep to themselves from the most part, but you learn very quickly to never look the animals in the eyes if they approach you. The grizzlies are hibernating, the male polar bears are hunting on the sea ice, while the females are denned up with the new cubs. Wolves aren't unheard of, but rarely leave the Brooks Range Mountains a couple of hundred miles to the south. Whatever the operator saw, we would keep watch. But it wasn't our problem. It was a problem for the bear police. We went about our work, albeit cautiously. It's interesting to note that oil companies on the slope have private security officers who besides being private law enforcement, also try to minimize encounters with wildlife. We refer to them as the Bear Police, which is a cute name for a rather dangerous part of their job. These security officers are the only personnel on the North Slope, outside of regular law enforcement, that can carry firearms. Their primary job when encountering large predators is to harass them until they leave. This is done by beanbag gun or loud noises at first. When that fails, or if the animal is unusually aggressive, lethal force may be required. We had settled into our work and forgot about the creature. I needed to take a leak. I got out of the truck and walked behind the well house to take care of business. My crewmate came over the radio telling me to get back in the truck. There was a wolf coming out from behind the warehouse where I had just been and he was pacing after me. I didn't look behind me. I just ran back and jumped into the truck. I'm not taking chances even if it was a crewmate's practical joke. Once inside, I looked out and sure enough, trotting towards the truck was a large black male wolf. He approached our trucks and plopped down on the snow in front of it. This wolf looked rough. 
even by wild animal standards. The right side of his face was mutilated and deformed, missing his right eye and most of the skin and lips on that side of his head. The wound exposed large white teeth, giving him the appearance of a wide crooked smile. He didn't appear aggressive, but he didn't take his good eye off us. That one good eye was bright and red in appearance. It was eerie, the way he just sat there, staring, watching, and waiting. We radioed the security officers for help, and like a speeding bullet they showed up 40 minutes later. That whole time waiting, the wolf never diverted his attention from us. If I hadn't seen him breathing, I would have assumed it was his statue. The security officers arrived and took some pictures for their reports, then began the process of driving the animal back out into the tundra. Truck horns didn't startle him, not even flinched. Charging him with their truck did nothing either. Then they took aim with a beanbag gun and hit him square in the ribs. The wolf let out a yelp, but did not get up or move from his spot. The next beanbag hit him in the head, and that jostled him enough to get up and leave. I was able to snap a quick picture of the guy before I managed to leave the work site. Security told us to call back if we saw the wolf again. They seemed confident he would move on and not be a bother anymore. The sun was setting and our job was still hours from wrapping up. Working a 13 to 15 hour day isn't unusual. You get used to the long hours or you find another line of work pretty quickly. I was running the computer equipment inside the truck and weird data was coming back from the tools down in the well. They were blanking out and losing signal or they were reporting data backwards, but diagnostics wasn't indicating any issues. To the computer system, everything was operating normally. I tried a few different things to fix the issue, but it persisted. One of the workers went out to the wellhead to check the gauges and cables, trying to isolate the problem from there. He was outside for no more than five minutes before the night was pierced by a long bellowing howl. This was immediately followed by the high-pitched shriek of our crewmates throwing the door open, and I was able to catch a fleeting glimpse of a large dark figure running behind the wellhouse. Our crewmate ran past us and jumped inside, pale, sweating, and full of adrenaline as he tried to relay what happened. Through his panting, he said he was in the wellhouse checking the cables when someone walked up behind him. Thinking it was one of us, he started a conversation with his back turned. When he got no reply, he was met face to face with a seven foot tall black wolf standing on its hind legs, between him and the door, growling. Without thinking, he flung his pipe wrench at the beast and struck him hard in the chest. That's when it let out a howl and ran off. Our crewmate was adamant this was the same wolf from earlier because its face was mangled in that crooked half smile and one fiery red eye. Myself and the others of the crew had a hard time believing he saw a giant wolf man. We had no doubt he saw the wolf, but we reasoned that in his panic he hallucinated that it was upright like a man. But we'd all encountered enough weird things on the slope to never count out the impossible. We radioed the security officers and told them the wolf had returned and waited inside the truck. What else could we do but wait? I wasn't about to go in there and fight Satan's guard dog with a clipboard and mouse pad. Every time we felt like things settled down outside, we would hear a growl or something, or a push against the truck. Periodically, we would see something pacing in the dark, just beyond the reach of the light. Even though we were inside a locked truck cabin, it was still a very vulnerable feeling. We were very much trapped. I'm sure it felt somewhat similar to what divers experience inside a shark cage far out at sea. All of this went on for about an hour, while we waited for someone to show up. Finally, coming up the road, we see headlights of three approaching vehicles. The security team showed, this time with actual rifles. Over the radio, we told them what had been going on. You could feel their disbelief and eyes rolling through the radio. That sass and disbelief soon faded when we explored the worksite and found it covered in fresh, large wolf tracks. The security team split up with two trucks, headed out to search for the wolf, while the last one remained with us as we loaded our equipment and finished our job. 
We didn't hear or see anything else that night as we cleaned up, but we sure did keep our heads on a swivel. The security officers didn't find the wolf that night. A set of tracks left the work site and out into the open tundra. The officers commented the tracks looked weird. This was due to them only seeing the back paw prints in the snow. The last security truck escorted us back to the main camp while the others continued to search in the night. For the following weeks, various reports came in across the oil field of people seeing this mangled black wolf during the day. And at night, reports kept coming in of a black beast walking upright and harassing or cornering workers. Security seemed to always show up minutes too late. During this time frame, many of the Alaskan native workers were getting nervous. One of our friends in the camp workshop was from Nuksut, a small Inupiat village just west of the oil field. He told us it sounded exactly like a Ijarak, a shape-shifting creature that can take the form of any arctic animal while it hunts. He said it was obvious, as the wolf was a normal, albeit deformed animal in the daylight, but transformed into an upright monster in the night. The Ijirak are thought to be Inuit hunters that travel too far north and became stuck between the world of the living and the dead. They transformed into evil, deformed men with sideways mouths and eyes. They use their powers of shape-shifting to hunt other Inuit, especially children. The Inupiat are weary of wild animals for this very reason. A week following our encounter, the security team was able to corner the wolf on a remote work site. It had attacked and trapped two welders in their truck. Both workers had superficial cuts through their snowsuits, but were otherwise fine. Having no other choice, the wolf was euthanized on the spot. Security shot the wolf once, and instead of dropping dead, it charged at the officer that shot it. The wolf took three more high-powered rifle shots before it eventually collapsed at the feet of the officer. Even then, paralyzed in the now crimson snow, the wolf was still growling through its crooked smile. And after several minutes, it finally succumbed to its wounds. The wolf's body was taken to the University of Alaska Fairbanks for dissection and examination. Outside of the facial deformities and gnarl appearances, the biologists concluded it was an ordinary wolf from the Brooks Range Mountain. How it got hundreds of miles from home and why it stayed on the tundra is a complete mystery. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least, as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping around 7k feet that night, or right where the tree lines started thinning out. So when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up slash make dinner, but I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up at this steep, tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when he sees marmots. Not the excited, oh, you're lucky because I'd rip you apart if my master wasn't here. Talking high-pitched barks, but unsure, concerned barks. Now, the day before, I had found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago, and I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before. So I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So while still concerned, I start hiking up this steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep, I had to use the trees to balance and lean against, so I didn't go tumbling down before making another five to six steps push to the next tree that I could lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making it up this hill, 
hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about a hundred feet up the hill, and I hear a whole lot of big movement about fifty feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage, slobbering, flying everywhere type of bark. My heart starts pounding out of my chest, and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in a matter of seconds, because if this was a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die. Then I'm stuck here. If I have to get off this hillside fast, I am a hundred percent going to trip and fall off the twelve to fifteen foot cliff onto the boulders below. So I'm feeling pretty screwed right about now. Then I hear my other little dogs start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent so she didn't wander off while I was away. I was panicking at this point. A few moments later, after I snapped back to it, and I take another few seconds to start putting my survival priorities in order and call my dog back to me, he comes and sits at my feet, and my back is against a tree. So I'm kind of pinned slash stuck there for the moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I tried to collect myself. This is when I realized I had completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. So I reach up fast to turn it on. I basically punch myself in the face. I have some serious adrenaline dumps going on right now, so much that my knees are beginning to shake. I just get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection of eyes or whatever's up there. Peering, peering, nothing. But I had just heard something we both did, and whatever it was didn't get away or sound like it had gone too far. I knew something was there, so I'm kind of just steadfast at this point. I need to know what it is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. I'm looking up at this hill, and at one point my dog lunges forward, unpinning me. He does a fake bluff charge up the hill about fifteen feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does, I finally see movement, something moving up and breaking the tree line. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in. I called my dog back and silently watch, and that is when I make out something, and it made my heart completely drop. There was a man, crouched about seventy-five feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes, but some raggedy crap with a hood. That blended into the environment perfectly, almost like a makeshift guile suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something. But I knew that we were staring at each other at that very moment. So I stare for what seems like minutes. No words. I just felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him. But I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little black dog at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared. And I also had to get off that hill before total darkness took control, or I could be seriously hurt, slash risk dying trying to get back down. So carefully, I started heading back down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree, holding me up, and I look in that direction again, just to make it even more clear I saw him. And eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time I finally jump down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking, and I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark. Dachshunds do that, or just barking back at my dog. But when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent, and was walking around the camp, growling, with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought, okay, maybe she got her nose between the zipper and worked her way out. But I was positive I had zipped it so the zipper tag opening was at the very top of the tent door, thus, out of reach. So in a mixture of being terrified. And pissed off, and the feeling of needed to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my point forty. 
I fired a single shot into the air as the sun was setting, climbing into my tent without eating and lay with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my stuff and ready to leave, heading down the mountain. It sucks. It was all downhill back, but I couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I made it to the last camp, about four miles from my vehicle, but thankfully there were other people there. We sat around the fire they made, and I felt relieved and safe. They started to tell me they were planning to head the way I went. I tell them my story in detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on. Other people had had similar experiences as mine. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and a woman was found murdered last year. My name is Crystal, and these stories happened to my dad. Back in the 70s, my dad was running a trap line deep in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. He was always hunting and going off by himself when he was a young adult. This was way before I was even a thought, he was in his late twenties, and a large, burly man, at around six foot two, and maybe 250 pounds of muscle. Very mountain man-like. After a while of being there, he noticed that animals were disappearing from his traps. Piles of hair, or even just a foot would be left. Of course, there were predators wanting to score an easy meal, scavengers and the like. But he'd been trapping in this area for a long time, and nothing like this had ever happened before. It wasn't hard to tell what it was. A young brown bear from the trail it left. My dad was always prepared with protection, so decided to go after it. The trail led my dad to an old mine shaft. Boards were still attached when he found the entrance. Some mining hard hats and tools were left. The trail led right into it, and with a lantern in hand, he headed inside. It seemed straight until it wasn't curving around some until he found the back where they stopped digging. The bear was nowhere to be found. However, when he started back out of the mine, he didn't realize there was an air chamber that clipped off the main section. The bear had hidden out there until the last minute. The bear had pushed its weight onto my dad's back, making him fall onto his stomach, and the bear bit down onto his shoulder. However, something was wrong, he didn't feel like a regular bite, something was off. The bear rolled my dad onto his back, and that's when my dad noticed why the bite was different. The bear had gotten shot in its jaw, so it was crooked and not able to close its mouth right. The bear tried to bite my dad again, knocking his pistol from his hand. Trying to avoid the bear's claws, my dad was able to pull out his bowie knife and was able to get the bear off by stabbing it over and over. He was saddened to have to take its life but it was more of a mercy killing. The bear wasn't able to hunt for itself, it was starving. After the deed was done, he decided to leave the bear's body in the mine shaft. Cut up and bleeding, my dad took his trap line and headed back home. I was on a Duke of Edinburgh expedition a while back and we were starting to get very tired and noticed it was starting to get very dark. We decided to destroy our fruit and find a quicker way to the campsite. The way we chose took us through an extremely boggy road. I did the Duke of Edinburgh Award cycling back then, so this kind of stuff was extremely difficult, out in the middle of nowhere. As we went on, it started pouring down with rain, but we quickly spotted a broken down barn that still had its roof slightly intact, so we decided that would be the best place to be and stopped off there to try and wait out the storm. As we were chatting about how crap this experience had been so far, I noticed something to the side of me. It was a door. And I know what you're thinking. It's just a door, nothing wrong with it. Well, that's where you're wrong. It seemed out of place with the barn, as it looked refurbished and it had a huge padlock on it. The padlock didn't look rusted, no. It looked brand new. 
I just thought it might be a coincidence, maybe, until I looked closer and realised that on the door spray painted on there was a sign saying free candy. Well, that did it to me, I told my friend. At this point I got freaked out, so we informed the rest of the group about it. However, instead of picking up our bikes and leaving, one of us decided to basically act like they weren't scared. So they went up to the door and knocked three times. At this point, me and my friends were ready to get out of there. And I'm never going to forget this, as three knocks sounded instantly after the boy knocked three times on it. And they weren't short separate knocks. Oh no, they were in a beat. I instantly bolted out of there with my friend, with the others not too close behind. It was definitely the scariest moment of my life. I had no intention of finding out who or what was hiding behind the free candy door in the middle of the woods, and I don't think I want to find out. A buddy of mine is a marine, and was doing an exercise deep in the woods with his unit one day, and he eventually got lost. After walking around for a bit, Trying to find out where he was, he came across three guys and asked them for directions. They pointed him in the direction of his camp and he was able to get back. Shortly after he got back, he and his unit started to pack up and leave, and he told his sergeant that there were still guys out in the woods. His sergeant said that he was the last one back and they were waiting on him to leave. He told his buddies about it, and it turns out that another unit that did exercise in the area way back in the day had three marines go missing. There had been other marines that got lost in the same area, and they'd had similar experiences of running into three guys that pointed them in the right direction. It's just very spooky and strange. In high school, some friends and I would often cruise in the back roads of our small town and break into abandoned houses and use our video cameras to capture ghost videos. One night, we drove by a very deep ravine that was dried up and the ground was covered in leaves. I said we should check it out and see who would go furthest into the ravine. Three of us went in and the other three stayed behind, saying it was way too scary to check out. While we were walking, we saw an empty gallon jug, then came across a piece of blue clothing, then some other trash. We didn't have the flashlight turned on to add to the effect, we just used it every now and then to see things better. The moon was full, but it was very hard to see because of all the tree covering, when suddenly a cold chill ran down my back and I felt like we weren't alone. I froze. My friends stopped immediately with me. They knew what I had felt. We could hear a rush of branches breaking and leaves crunching. It was all around us at the top of the ravine. My friend shined his light and we could see people rushing all around us. We turned and ran the way we came in, just into darkness. I'm so amazed none of us fell. We got to the car and started pounding on it as we jumped in and I got into the driver's seat and we floored it out of there. We were deep in the woods, maybe 20 miles from town, but rushed home, all of us talking at once. We've all been warned by authorities to stay out of the woods, that strange and terrible things happen in there, but we didn't listen. Things could have ended much differently for us. I'm glad we made it out okay. For context, the town is a tiny place way south of San Antonio. Maybe 15 people live there. We've heard that drug trafficking and human trafficking are very common in the area. Bodies are always found in the woods. Further south from where we were, there's a mass graveyard behind a cemetery of bodies of people found in the woods. The country just didn't know what to do with all the bodies. So I think it might have been something akin. When I was around 10, I ran away from home. My ex-stepfather and his wife took me way up into the mountains and hid me. Everything was fine until my stepdad's friend came to our camp. Not sure why my stepdad and his wife left, but they did, leaving me alone with this friend. All during my growing up, I had been warned that this guy liked his girls young, and to not be left alone with him. Yet here I was, miles from help, with this way older dude getting creepier and creepier in his comments and actions. I waited till he stepped out for a leak, grabbed the horse I had been assigned to and went to hide in the woods. I got far enough away to where I couldn't be seen and hunkered down to wait for the safe adults to come back. 
I could see the guy hunting around for me, but he couldn't see me. It was dark and luckily my horse stayed quiet. I don't know for certain what the guy wanted, but I'm glad my instincts led me to choose the woods and get away from him. I'm almost 49, and it hadn't occurred to me that till last night at work, the whole thing was a giant red flag made of smaller red flags. I have never been so grateful to have listened to that inner voice. Of course, it was kind of hard to ignore, since I was shrieking by then. My stepfather and his wife, obviously, were not good people. My family and I went on a trip to the Hocking Hills area of Southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town of Moonville Rail Tunnel. I'd never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect, but I did know it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We start driving, and it's, for lack of better words, real impoverished where we were driving. Hills have eyes-esque. We literally only see a few cars on the way there and are on back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into a forest and we are close to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering Bubba Wood. For a little information, I drive a Mercedes that I'm just lucky to have and have my husband in the car, a black man with dreadlocks and my 10-year-old non-verbal autistic son and my 6-year-old daughter. We drive down this really creepy stone road in the forest and there's nothing back there, no houses, no cars, no one. We see signs that we are close and pull into the parking lot. There's a footbridge which we walk over and make our way towards the tunnel, which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel towards us while we're on foot. He gets out of his truck with a chainsaw and it's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere we go and through the tunnel. I try to make small talk with him and he pulls some info that he worked for the Department of Natural Resources and he really wasn't budging. We turn around and walk out of the tunnel and he starts using the chainsaw behind us and the sound is just echoing through the tunnel. At this point we have no cell service and literally no one knows my family is out there except us. I was really worried about my car and sending the wrong idea to people like we have money or something. We rush to the car and get the kids into their booster seats and this guy comes driving over the footbridge in his truck towards us in the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how his truck fits on it. He stops again, gets out of his truck and starts walking in the other direction much to our relief. About this time I notice there are dusty handprints on my car. I ask my husband if they were his and we compared his hand and my son's and they were not a match. I don't know who could have touched the car because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time we were there and we get out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later I look in my rear view mirror and there's a bunch of dust kicked up behind us and there he is. He had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch us up like that. There's nowhere to go in these woods. The road is basically one lane and we have no cell service or GPS. Every time I think we lose him, he's there again. I'm waiting for my tires to get popped or something or this guy to ram me off the road into a ravine in the woods. Finally, we get out of the woods and I turn out and he's still following. We were following directions printed to get back and I end up making a wrong turn in the excitement. The guy in the truck was finally gone and I turned around to go back past the stone road that goes into the forest. There was one lone house near this road and there is his truck parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto the road into the woods and taken some back way to the tunnel. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event and I wish it never happened to anyone ever. And there you have it, day two of Nature Week comes to a close with a thrilling collection of stories I really hope you enjoyed. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to my amazing members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen. Of course, the glowy sparkly ones are the people who actually are members and patrons and people who give donations in the chat. So thank you so much for that. Seriously, guys, you mean the world to me. And I hope you keep coming back for more stories 
uh, for the rest of the week and beyond because the stories are really good. All right then, guys. Until next time, stay awesome. More videos on screen, and I'll see you in the next one.